We hope to train up our children for success in the world, but what does that really mean? How do we understand success? Michelle Kinder is going to be with us to talk about her upbringing as a third culture child, the product of missionaries in Guatemala uh, who were U.S. citizens, and how that shaped her vision of service in the world. Stay tuned for Good God. Welcome to Good God, conversations that matter about faith and public life. I'm your host, George Mason, and I'm delighted to welcome today Michelle Kinder to Good God. Welcome, Michelle. Thank you so much. I'm so pleased to be here with you. All right. Uh, likewise, I've looked forward to this for so long. So for those of you who are uh, watching or listening, uh, Michelle uh, works with leaders around social change and uh, seeking to improve the well-being of individuals and families and communities and has been at work in doing that f for several decades now in various roles in the nonprofit world and uh, counseling and uh, education and writing and advocacy and all of those sorts of things, right? So True. Uh, anyway, Michelle, it's... Um, the several decades thing stings a little. Uh, I had to kind of get my head around that, but I guess it's but, true. <laughs> but you started when you were a teenager, so let's right. put it that way. A, a wee pup. That's right. <laughs> but let's go to that wee pup idea because part of this whole question of who we are and what we do and how it's linked is about how we're brought up, what the circumstances of our life uh, were, and, and how we came to a self-understanding about vocation. And your story is a fascinating one because you're a third culture kid. True. Explain to people what third culture means and in your particular case especially. Yes, so third culture kid is a child who's growing up in a country that is a different culture than the country their parents grew up in. Mm -hmm. And so my parents are from the United States, from Texas, but I was born and raised by them yes. in Guatemala. Right. One of six kids, right? True. Amazing, yes. And so here you are, your dad is this seven foot tall, <laughs> big giant white man in <laughs> Guatemala. Yes. And, uh, and uh, you live in, 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 and grow up there uh, to what age? So I was there pretty much full time until I was 14 and then I came to boarding school in mm -hmm. the States, but my family was still there. Okay. So summers, Christmas is so pretty much my whole life. Right. So what are the values that shaped you from your faith experience as a missionary kid there? Hmm. I've thought a lot about that and, and like many people kind of went through the the steps of how it's all scaffolded mm -hmm. a little bit of sleep until I started reflecting on it. But now mm -hmm. looking back, there's some key things I think. One is from the beginning, my parents embodied uh, this idea that they belong to the community. Mm -hmm. And and that we just understood that and we saw it in the way that they um, spent their time and in the way that they um, talked about what they cared about in front of us. and. Mm -hmm. And so I, I don't think I ever um, imagined a life different than that. Okay. And so even though I, my expression of that is different than theirs, I think I always understood I belong to the community. That was a big one. The other, I think the gift of having uh, grown up in Guatemala as, a, as an American child, um, is you know every single thing around me at all times was done at least two different ways uh -huh. and so there was just a real appreciation for difference and diversity and a hunger for understanding well why do people do what they do and why do people think like they think that always felt engaging to me mm -hmm. and not threatening okay um, which i think is a thread that's carried through as well w when you think about that um we, we seem to be afraid of cultural differences today. Mm -hmm. uh, there's, a, there's a great sense that we have to sort of preserve our culture because it's being infringed upon by another culture. I, I, I understand anthropologically the language of culture, rituals, and the way people organize their lives, but I think what we, we don't really, we're not really talking about food and family and um, and the, the way people 
um, relate to one another uh, on an everyday basis, there seems to be uh, some other kinds of fear about that. What do you, how can you mm -hmm. put your finger on that? Mm. I, the, what captures me about that is just the fear piece and, mm. and all the ways that we play smaller in the world when we're um, believing that there is a, just a certain amount and if we don't scramble uh. for hours, then mm -hmm. um, we, we are left. Uh, mm -hmm. And so I think that just understanding mm -hmm. that there's a choice to sort of operate culturally and just in the world from a posture of scarcity or abundance. Yes. Yes. Um, and I think when you're coming from a posture of abundance, um, which is, you know, speaking of the God part of this podcast, that's the promise, right? There's, there is that promise of mm -hmm. abundance. And if you can kind of stay in that mindset, right. then you get really um, comfortable and curious about differences and, um, and, and the ways that other people's culture bumping up against yours shapes you in yes. a way that can be enriching and not threatening. It does seem to me that when I read the Bible, uh, this is a very common theme mm -hmm. in the scripture, right? That, uh, that w when the children of Israel were in Egypt, uh, they were taught a scarcity mentality. Mm -hmm. And when they depart from Egypt and they are journeying to the promised land of what? Uh, milk and honey, <laughs> right? Abundance, uh, it's, it's out there. All along the way, they receive their daily food. Mm -hmm. uh, Jesus does the miracle of multiplying the loaves and fish, challenging always this scarcity mentality. Mm -hmm. And yet we have uh, Christian people today and our religious community seeming to support a vision of our country that is based upon this sort of zero-sum game. Mm -hmm. There's only so much and we're going to lose if we uh, if we receive immigrants mm -hmm. uh, into our country or um, uh, if we send jobs overseas mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and foster a global economy so that everyone can prosper. Uh, so th there's a kind of forgetfulness that takes place, which is what makes our, uh, I think, our religious communities so vitally important is to keep the true narrative mm. out there, the true story, isn't it? Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes. I. Um, personally, when I think about the things that would break God's heart, the, the one that's probably most profound to me is just the way we're captured by fear and scarcity. Yeah. And I just picture God up there just like, just with tears, like, what, what, you know, mm. what are you forgetting? Like, what, how are you losing sight of the fact that there's enough for everyone and that you are all each other's? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I want to go back to being a missionary kid, growing up in the church and in a, um, a, a religious household. Uh, it feels today like so many people who grow up uh, as preacher's kids or missionary's kids, they, they rebel, they leave the faith. They, um, and, and even those who just simply grew up in the church, there's a, there's a lot of uh, a loss of confidence in faith and in the church these days. How have you been able to maintain mm. your faith? And what, what have been some of the keys? What would you tell people who are uh, fragile about their faith today? Mm -hmm. I would say, as I think I fall into the end of many crowd um, in that I definitely uh, rebelled you did. and definitely felt like I don't understand the, a lot of how um, religion was framed mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. in my growing up years. And I still am not okay with so much of that, especially mm -hmm. the parts that are excluding. And ah, okay. um, the, the thing though that kept me grounded, uh, and, and there were per big periods of my time where although I was guided by this, I wouldn't have called it anything Mm -hmm. um, I would have just said, that's not for me anymore. Right. But when I look back, I can see the thread that kept me grounded was the way my parents were in a personal relationship with God. Yes. And, um, and they were so service oriented mm -hmm. and so 
normal. <laughs> yeah. You know, they were just grounded, normal, kind, loving people who right. sought to give mm -hmm. to everyone they were in relationship with, but also be changed by everyone they were in relationship with. And so there was not that, I'm gonna collect souls, I'm not here to save you. Like right, they were right. way ahead of their time on the mission field right. um, with understanding that this is about relationships and it's about showing up in community. So it reminds me of the, uh, the Lilla Watson quotation that you're yeah. fond of, I know too, yes. about if, if you've come here to help me, yeah. uh, to help us, you're wasting your time. Yeah. But if you've come here to join our liberation right. with yours, uh, then you're welcome, let's, let's work together. Yes, love and, that. And I, I agree, and I, I think that some of the things that, um, that people are rejecting about the faith today are things that probably you and I reject about right. the way faith is is uh, practiced, the right. way people envision it. You use the language of exclusion, for instance, right. dividing up the world and in, in certain ways in order for us to be able to feel in or out and mm -hmm. uh, those sorts of things. So uh, I, I, I always tell people who come to me and who are struggling with um, uh, with faith and and the church uh, to. Uh, to, to recognize that it's human beings mm -hmm. and uh, and that faith is evolving too, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, and I think that we are in a deep struggle to understand what is the true nature of the story of God in the world. Right. And, uh, and increasingly what we're realizing is it's not about God swooping down to pick out a few favorites. Mm -hmm. uh, and to provide charity for others, but it is this grand narrative of God's uh, unconditional love for the world that is transforming and inviting all of us to join it. Mm, yes, you know? I, that's so lovely, and I think that's how it shows up for me today, is mm -hmm. just that belief that we can all be vessels for that, that um, like plugging into a divine and unlimited source of right. love right. that can then flow through us that is never about us, that to me is something I can sign on for and, right. and something that makes me feel very close to God, very close to other. Yeah. Um, the, and, and, um, and feels like a fair fight uh, with the complexity of the issues of the world and also the ways that religion gets weaponized. Uh. Um, like those two things feel so huge to me that when I engage in those spaces um, plugged into just my own finite source of power, um, I get depleted really fast and I get overwhelmed and sad and depressed and you know, what the heck, yeah. if, I, if I can S sort of stand in the face of that incredible complexity um, and see, but see myself as a vessel for grace having nothing to do with me mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. but just can I clear my vessel can I can I live in a way that uh, actively clears my vessel every day so that whatever needs to flow through me can um, that feels doable Wow, it, I, I think the language you're using there about flowing through is is important because so many, uh, think, I think, think of the life of faith as people having a kind of permanent deposit, uh, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. that you, you are holding something and you have been filled and, and you, this is uh, who you are, but but there is a sense and, and you're a runner and the, the more you, the more energy you expend, the more capacity you have for energy. And so it's, it's a little like that in the spiritual life, isn't it? It's Absolutely. more this sense of, 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 of God flowing through us. Absolutely, and I think the, the work is, are, are you so clogged up with your own stress, fear, ego, mm -hmm. whatever, that that is not happening? Yeah. Um, or can you make, can you build practices into your day so that you you are a clear vessel. Right. It just feels, uh, the doable word I'll repeat because it is overwhelming right now to show yes. up in the world as a, as a presence for you know, love and truth mm -hmm. and um, justice. Uh, but if, if you can depersonalize it and think of instead, think instead of, of, or I'll speak for myself, when I depersonalize it and, and 
and don't rely on my own wisdom or my own anything except for my commitment to be as clear a vessel as I can and pursue, like unapologetically pursue alignment. When I do those two things, um, though, then I think whatever I'm meant to do in this world seems to come, come seems to, to pass. To right. Well, let's pick that up at, uh, after this break. Uh, this has been fun to get started, but we have so much more to talk about. So <laughs> thank you, Michelle. Thank you. We'll be right back. Thank you for continuing to tune in to Good God. These conversations are part of a larger program that is called Faith Commons, the umbrella organization, you might say, of Good God. Good God is the first project of Faith Commons, which is a nonprofit organization that is intended to do public theology, you might say. Uh, it's multi-faith, not just Christian, Jewish, Muslim, other faiths, but all of them becoming involved in the question of how do we promote the common good together. There are so many areas of need and concern in our community, and Faith Commons is trying to help bridge the gaps uh, between religions and peoples in our community so that we can have a more just and peaceful society. Thanks for continuing to support us. Welcome back to Good God. I'm here with Michelle Kinder, and we were just talking about the intersection of faith and vocation. And Michelle, you spent 20 years as the CEO of the Momentous Institute. Uh, tell us about how you got there, how you discovered a sense of call to this kind of community work, and, uh, and, and how all of that came to be. Oh, perfect. Yeah, I was there 20 years. I served as a CEO six. Okay. Um, but I was there 20 years. Mm -hmm. And it's actually, to me, a super God-oriented story of how I got there. Um, three years prior to starting there, I was leaving Austin to move to Dallas. Just had my master's degree in educational psychology, was working as a therapist. And I got that community council book. I don't know if you remember it. it mm -hmm. I don't think it's printed anymore, but it's about a two-inch book of all the nonprofits in town. Mm -hmm. And I was, you know, an arrogant, just got my master's 20-something. And so I started calling everyone in the book, and nobody was going to hire me. I didn't have my license. I was too mm -hmm. green. And, and it was depressing. And I called Delane Kenny, who was the clinical director of what's now Momentous Institute, and she also was not going to hire me. But she was so kind, mm -hmm. and she related to me as a human. Um, and spent a little time talking to me. And I just made a mental note that I want to work somewhere where people treat everyone in that way. Uh -huh. And so I worked for three years in other places, got my license, and then I went and knocked on Delane's door and said, I want to work for you now. Mm -hmm. And that was 20 years ago. And so it was a, an extraordinary time. Um, mm -hmm. Had the opportunity to work as a therapist and school counselor and then led the clinical team and then the last six years led the team and it, it's it's an unmatched experience i can't say enough good things and it was really focused on at-risk kids right yeah children and families and social emotional health and right. yeah in a, in a kind of holistic way in mm -hmm. fact which is uh, something that is not always uh, done because people focus on one aspect or another. True, and and I think we stumbled in those same directions. Okay. I think because it's a hundred year organization, we had lots of time to marinate and mm -hmm. lots of time to course correct, and mm -hmm. you get to make most mistakes in hundred years <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and right. learn from them. And so we, if, if you kind of look at the history, I still use the we and us pronouns, maybe I always will, uh, but if you look at the history of Momentous Institute, it it definitely followed that same pattern of focusing first on the child and then understanding that the child is part of a family and then understanding the family is part of a community. Yes. And so um, it absolutely uh, was a more holistic, is a more holistic approach now than when it first started. And I, I predict five, ten years from now, again, they won't recognize their work because it's just a highly iterative, very mm -hmm. um, innovative place. 
So what would you say were some of the important marks of your tenure there? Uh, when you look back and say, you know, this is what I'm proud of. This is what I'm grateful for. Mm -hmm. This is what I learned and how we helped move uh, the needle a bit uh, while I was there. What mm -hmm. would you say? Mm -hmm. I think the first big thing is we moved the team and the board and the salesmanship club away from thinking about our, about our work as providing a service mm -hmm. to participating in a movement. Uh. And that was big because it's a humble group. And mm -hmm. so they literally, we were not talking about ourselves unless we needed clients and we never mm -hmm. needed clients. Right. Right. And so um, what, what happened is we moved from that mentality to a mentality of um, how, are, how do we become good stewards of this almost 100 year history and share what we know as mm -hmm. widely and as freely as we can? Mm -hmm. um, and how do we you know, shout from the mountaintops what we've learned about what works for children and families and communities? Right. So that was a big shift and mm -hmm. I think it helped us impact uh, way more children and families and communities and other professionals than we could have ever served directly. Mm -hmm. That's a big one. Um, I think another really proud point for the team and for me was uh, during my tenure we were recognized as one of the top 100 best places to work for women in the country mm -hmm. and one of the top 50 best places to work in Texas. Mm -hmm. And what that translated to me is that we had operationalized this commitment to parallel process and that we understood that if you don't create conditions for the team doing the work that are socially emotionally healthy, they cannot provide that social emotional health for the children and families. Uh. And then the children and families can't embody social emotional health so 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 very often in the nonprofit world there's a mentality of you know people just need to you know work way crazy hours and right. there's a correlation between suffering and how much you care and mm -hmm. you know some of those old adages and so I think we pushed way beyond that to a place of understanding that a high performing well cared for team is your best shot at these complex issues well I, I want to take that even uh, another step in uh, when, when I listen to you about that, it also occurs to me that that's true in for-profit corporations, mm -hmm. that even if they are philanthropically generous and involved in the charitable world, often uh, they, it seems, uh, don't uh, take a hard look at their own culture mm -hmm. uh, to make it uh, friendly to people's health and well-being, uh, to make it a, a place hospitable to women's uh, mm -hmm. uh, work life. And, uh, and so what happens is they maximize their, their profits uh, and they sometimes take advantage of their workers but then get the good feelings of being philanthropically involved in charitable causes in the community which then has to go address the very things that they've helped to create in their own corporations. It's, it's, a, it's a, a really vicious cycle, isn't it? It really is, and it's an, it's an unfortunate exit ramp that the community has tolerated. Um, mm -hmm. the, the generosity on the philanthropic end um, mm -hmm. almost pulls light around, away from integrity from beginning to end. Yes. And, um, and there is a sense of frustration for many communities around um, this, this money that is given, a small percentage of the money that is given to solve problems that were created many times by <laughs> the very people that are giving the money or the policies, the political right. policies that are put in place sometimes mm -hmm. very on purpose right. um, to help some and hurt others. Right. Uh, so yeah, I think I think I hope that we have a, an evolution coming where we are looking a, at a, a way, at also not the zero sum game for corporations, right? right? So right. more of the conscious capitalism of like right. how can all of your stakeholders be well taken care of, um, and how can can we um, close some of the exit ramps 
that don't hold people accountable for how they're investing their money, corporations and people. How are you investing your money? How are you making your money? And then, yes, thank you for giving some of it away. That is great, but mm -hmm. it, it doesn't absolve us from the other parts of the puzzle. Right. It, it, the, the caring for your workers, uh, for example, yes. and, and realizing that you are part of a community and that uh, it, the the only people who have a stake in your company are not shareholders. They're, right. they're, the stakeholders are also the people who come to work every day. So we have this uh, th this very kind of situation right now with uh, the new um, uh, ordinance that's been passed in Dallas for earned paid sick leave, for mm -hmm. instance, which is something that shouldn't really even have to be addressed because mm -hmm. if um, businesses were treating their employees in a fair and generous way, uh, that would be something that would uh, relieve the anxiety of workers and create uh, well-being in families and uh, consistency in businesses and loyalty and all those sorts of things. And yet, when the city council has to step in and pass a, 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 an ordinance about this, then it's contested by the business community uh, with the idea that there should be no pressure on business to do the right thing, even if they're not doing the right thing. Mm -hmm. And so we end up with this, this, this really unnecessary mm -hmm. contest between the public and private sectors mm. on something that is about humanity and our social well-being. Right, and and the lie that if you take good care of all your stakeholders, you make less money. Yes, and that mm -hmm. that's a lie, but it's a it's a short game lie, and most people are trapped by the short game. So, just to go back to momentous for a moment, uh, one of um, one of my partners in. Uh, Faith Commons and Good God is Jay Pritchard, and he worked at the Richards Group and helped to name Momentus, uh, rebrand re you and all of that. And so, Jay, I just did a plug for you, so I uh, <laughs> feel good about that. But, uh, but uh, tell us about the process of moving into that new identity and branding. What happened there? Yeah, it was, it was an important step. Um, mm -hmm. Prior to that, we were the Salesmanship Club Youth and Family Centers. Right which is a mouthful. Mm -hmm. um, most people didn't get the acronym right, didn't yes. get the name right, um, right, and it took you a full two minutes to explain the name, uh -huh. and you never even talked about kids yet, and yes. so you sort of lost your audience before mm -hmm. you could even mm -hmm. get to work. Um, so that, that was a, an important shift, and that was um, a time when we moved away from that sort of service providing mentality Good. of like I Good. do a group for depressed moms on Thursday night to yeah. we're about social emotional health for all children Good. so they can achieve their full potential. Right. And that was Ruth Fitzgibbons who yes. z zoned in on that, that idea that social emotional health is the one thing that kind of glued everything we were doing right. together authentically. We've had Ruth on Good God, by the way. I saw that. Yeah, and she's uh, delightful and is now uh, finding her way in uh, her retirement years to figure out how she's going to be involved in the community. So uh, what a delightful soul she is. Uh, well, uh, w when, when people hear about the connection with the Salesmanship Club, I think they, many people automatically think Red Pants yes. and the Byron Nelson Golf Tournament. Yes. And it is a remarkable uh, fundraising tool uh, that they've, they've had, but I'm not sure everybody understands that these are, these are all business people who have committed themselves to a, a kind of earnest uh, work uh, in this club. Uh, that it is a real service-oriented club. Mm -hmm. it, is, it is not just about the prestige of wearing red pants uh, one, uh, one week a year, mm -hmm. uh, but the, the, the amount of money raised for the causes of the Momentous Institute is really quite remarkable, isn't it? Oh, it's remarkable. And, um, and beyond the dollars, which you alluded to, their commitment to the organization is all year long. They mm -hmm. have a huge presence there. Mm -hmm. And they started first. A lot of people don't don't know that. Like the salesmanship club came first, and then they started Momentus right. Institute, which is uh, a, the flip of many many times that there's an attempt to kind of galvanize a volunteer base. Right. 
so they're not really volunteers they're really owners and mm -hmm. they act like it yes and they think like it and they're invested to that degree right. And one of the things that impresses me about them is that they have been learning through the years. Mm -hmm. uh, that they haven't just established a culture, but uh, just as you shifted in momentous uh, a kind of uh, move from a sort of service provider to being participants in a movement, mm -hmm. I, I, I sense that they uh, buy into that shift as well. Are they s that, that they're part of that transformation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's a, there's a desire to help the most kids possible mm -hmm. um, in the best way possible. And so I think Great. they um, they see the ways that the narrative around the importance of social emotional health that no one was talking about, right. uh, you know, several years ago, has now embedded itself in all the school districts around here, the mm -hmm. charter networks, families, mm -hmm. and so it, you know that that's a kind of impact from their blood, sweat, tears, and money Great. that is way beyond mm -hmm. the five thousand we might serve directly any given year. Well, you're not any longer employed uh, by the Momentous Institute, but uh, you are at work in the community still and uh, helping all the rest of us do our work. And we have another episode. We want to pursue some of those uh, questions with you as well. Great. So thank you for being on Good God, and we thank look forward you. to continuing the conversation. Michelle. My pleasure. Thank you, George. All right. <laughs>